began by asking him, Saudi betting the Argies, is that the biggest news? Or is Ronaldo once again the biggest story in football right now? Yeah, I mean, does he? Does he take all the headlines? He takes some of the news pages, I think. Look, Cristiano Ronaldo is leaving Man United. They've said it's mutual. It's immediate effect. He's going. Um, he had about 30 weeks left on a reported £500,000 a week contract. So that's millions upon millions upon squillions of pounds that he has apparently um, rejected the chance to to maybe get back through the courts. I think there was quite a interesting case for... Uh, dismissal, um, considering what he said to Piers Morgan during that controversial interview. So, look, he was always going to go. I think we know the reason for this interview was to force whatever has happened today to happen. He wanted to go. I think maybe he didn't feel like the club were going to let him go. And I think that there are lots of negatives here, but I think maybe we might have a positive. And the positive is that we're no longer talking about the fading force, Cristiano Ronaldo, who should never have gone back to Manchester United, whose final move of his career looked like being a massive failure, coming off the bench, whinging, moaning, and Cristiano Ronaldo, maybe football's greatest ever player, being a bit of a pathetic loser. What might happen now, hopefully, is that he goes somewhere, plays football, builds on his legacy, might have to give up a few quid, but becomes a footballer again, not Instagram star slash Man United sideshow. So there's a positive in there. Plus for Manchester United, they can move on from a saga that was almost completely of their own making. And it's another, I think, in the win column for Eric Ten Hag, who went to war with Cristiano and has come out, I think, as the big winner here. As a United fan, Tom, I've been asked by everyone I know, <clears throat> does it destroy his legacy? Look, I mean, just as a stupid, dumb fan, it doesn't for me. I loved him when, as a player when he was first there. I'm just glad that this is over. And I, I, I personally kind of feel we've got much bigger issues to deal with when the season starts again, like actually trying to find a number nine, trying to qualify for the Champions League and those kind of things. It's been a distraction, and that's all I care about. But I'm more interested in what your reaction in, is in terms of the legacy that he leaves first match. Man United and also you know what kind of a stain is this on his career or will we be forgetting about it like we'll forget about that interview by the time this World Cup ends I think that it doesn't stain his legacy in the long term but you know it will take time it's going to take time it's going to take his retirement as well you know I speak to former players all the time and quite rightly during their career they don't think about their retirement but often they say to me so often you know, you're a long time retired. And I think Cristiano Ronaldo, because of his world-renowned and international fame, can, can get away with the, the necessity to be on good terms with all of his former clubs. But you still want to be. Um, so look, I, I think it tarnishes his legacy temporarily. I think maybe with a generation of fans, you know, younger than me, 20 and younger. I think maybe they won't have fond memories of Cristiano Ronaldo. But there's a generation of fans who saw him the first time around. There's people who are maybe kind of 30 years old and above who will remember the player he used to be. Um, and I think in time he'll be welcomed back. But he has acted very poorly. You know, the club should never have brought him back. We know this. The, the club spent too much money on him so they couldn't drop him. And it's all been a bit of a mess. But he has not handled himself with class or dignity or with any respect for Manchester United or their fans. But he also... In that interview, which I think we will forget as well at some point, said a lot of home truths that I think the fans would agree with and know. So, look, when you retire, everything changes more often than not. When he's retired, he'll be welcome back. For now, I think it's best that he doesn't say anything about Man United for a little while. Good for his brand, good for the club, good for everybody. And in five years' time, we'll be like, oh, yeah, he went back. I'd totally forgotten about that. And look, if Boris Johnson could be welcome back, Cristiano would be welcome back. Come on. I mean, he's a footballer. I mean, let's be Are honest. Are you trying to annoy me now? How's What's that? going on here? Are you trying to upset me? Can I have enough on? <laughs> Boris Johnson wasn't welcomed the first time by the majority of citizens in the country. At least Ronaldo, at least Ronaldo told the occasional truth. Boris Johnson's a lying bag of garbage with a wig on.
He says it's the right time to leave Cristiano. Well, of course it's the right time to leave because you just orchestrated it, mate. Where's he going to go, though? I've been watching you know, the, the World Cup panel sitting there saying he might go to the United States. Why would he go to the United States? It's like playing second division football. I mean, if he's not going to actually go and play for a club in Europe, and I can't imagine any club after this that actually wants him, is he really going to catch the big bird and go and play in a, in a, in a league which, can, you know, compared to the leagues he's been playing in is a bit half-assed and also has no real place on the front pages of American sport? Well, there's, there's an interesting one, that, because firstly, if an MLS team did want to buy him, so LAFC into Miami, the kind of clubs that are on the coast and have some sort of fame and, and press coverage, certainly in their states and regions, I, I think that he would need to take a massive pay cut. And here's the big question. Does Cristiano Ronaldo want to play football? Or does he want to get paid like Cristiano Ronaldo should be getting paid in his own mind? And that's the issue. You know, Wayne Rooney made a brilliant point, the DC United manager a couple of days ago, who Ronaldo has been desperate for some reason to reignite, if not just ignite a war of words with. And he said, to paraphrase, that age comes to everyone and Cristiano Ronaldo has not dealt with it well. If he starts dealing with it well, look, if he started dealing with it well before all of this, he could have spent another five months at Man United, coming off the bench, playing a little bit of European football, winning uh, the FA Cup or something and finishing in the top four, handshakes all round and made, I think it's like 16 or 17 million pounds. He decided to be um, ridiculous about the entire situation and force his essential firing from the club. And so I hope he's done that to go play football. That requires a pay cut. I do think MLS would be interesting. Look at what Zlatan did at LA Galaxy is beloved by the American crowd. And as you know, I work in America quite a lot. And if you get 5% of the American market, you know, that's a huge yeah, is, yeah, amount of yeah. people. They've got 350 odd million people out there. 5% of the market is more than you get watching a game over here in the UK as the biggest sport in the country. So, you know, there will be eyeballs on it. He would raise the profile of MLS. I think it would be terrific for him as a career move to do to go to maybe LAFC, who've just won MLS Cup for the first time, it would be a great move. But they can't afford him, and I don't think he's the kind of guy who would take a pay cut. And that leads you to where's he going to go. And I would not be stunned to see him starting up front at Stamford Bridge come January. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, let's just wait and see because, you know, he, he may have decided it's the right time to leave, but I'm not quite sure that the last chapter of this saga has been written. Tom Rennie talks sport out of the UK with us. We've spent almost eight minutes talking about Cristiano, but we need to go back to that World Cup because Saudi Arabia have just absolutely stunned the world with this result. 36 matches unbeaten, the Argentinians. They take a predictable early lead. They have goals ruled out for offside, and once again, the VAR. I mean, ruling out a goal where a guy's feet and torso are behind the defender, but his pinky is in front is as insane as I think I've ever seen any video refereeing decision. But let's talk about the Saudis. They scored two cracking goals. The, the Kingdom's declared a public holiday already, Tom. Yeah, look, I mean, look, it's not easy to say uh, congratulations to Saudi Arabia um, uh, or Newcastle United, as they're occasionally known. But they did something in this game that I think really matters in that as they were up for it. You know, you see so many games of teams going through the motion. You see so many teams who don't believe they can win. And Saudi Arabia believe they can win. There's a really interesting narrative here for the years and the banning of being sports and the issues they've had in the region and the blockade that Saudi Arabia had against Qatar for an extended period of time. Gianni Infantino, that lovable horror story, was sitting there in between the Emir of Qatar and the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. So they're all friends again now. <laughs> right. Uh, Saudi Arabia sent thousands of fans over the border to Qatar, made it for the first time of all the games I've seen in, in, in the tournament feel like a home game against an away team. A friend of mine was there. I spoke to him about half an hour ago and he confirmed that's exactly how it felt inside the stadium. They scored a couple of terrific goals. The, the Aldasari winner on 53 minutes is sensational. It goes right up there come the end of this tournament with the best goals already scored. It was an absolutely sublime goal, as was the first one from Al Sherry as well. But, you know, the story is about Argentina. The story is about the lack of creativity. The story is uh, about not getting the best out of Lionel Messi, um, as they never have at a major tournament. You know, lots of people have got Argentina as favourites to win this competition. I don't think you win the World Cup with a 4-4-2, with Lionel Messi 
Messi nowhere near the player he once was. Still a great player, of course he is. But he's not the Lionel Messi of four years ago, who in that World Cup flopped in Russia. Angel Di Maria continues to play. De Paul and Paredes in midfield is not particularly inspiring. Romero at centre-half of Tottenham fame will kick you first and think about the ball later. And they picked Nicolas Ontomendi at centre-half. Yeah, that one, before they picked Lissandra Martinez of Man United, who's been fantastic for a couple of months. So Argentina did not look up for it. Argentina did not look anywhere near a team that can win this tournament. Saudi Arabia were bang up for it and deserved two wins. Statistically, according to Nielsen Grace note, it was the biggest upset in World Cup history. They had an 8.7% chance of winning, according to the Metadata Company, beating the previous um, biggest upset in World Cup history, which they've got as the USA beating England. In 1950, yeah. Shock in the history of the World Cup. So bad for Argentina, but the other game in their group was a draw between Denmark and Tunisia, uh, in, uh, between Mexico and Poland, forgive me. So I, I still think Argentina, though they lost, will win the next two and win the group. All right, Tom, thank you so much for that. Inga learn, Inga learn, Inga learn. You beat Iran 6 2. It's coming home, is it? Tell me it's coming home. I think there's a chance. Like, I, I do think England, I, I'd fancy England over Argentina to win the World Cup. I, I think they're on the same level as as France going into the tournament. I think they're they're below Brazil. I think they'll fancy their chances around the level of maybe maybe better than Spain because they haven't got a striker in England do. Look, they were terrific. I think we've been lulled into this position of thinking England have passed their peak because of how bad the Nations League has been and the, the loss against Hungary and how poor some of the performances have been. But the international games have come at really awful times for Premier League footballers and England were nowhere near wanting to play those Nations League games at the back of a 12-month season. This was maybe the best group stage England performance of Gareth Southgate's tenure, and they've got out of both groups they've been in in major competitions and made the semi-final and the final. It was confident. It was dominant. The goals were fantastic. The subs also chipped in. The likes of Rashford and Grealish came on and made a difference. There aren't many teams that can not start Phil Foden, who also come on. You know, it's a good squad. It's a deep squad. Bellingham and Rice in central midfield look very, very good. A massive upgrade on Calvin Phillips, who was alongside Rice in the European Championship. So England have got better from the team that lost the European Championship final. They've got better from the team uh, that got to the last World Cup semi-final. And I would not discount them. I wouldn't say it's coming home, but I would certainly say they're at the bus stop asking for directions.